Welcome everyone, I'm Marcel Swart, IKN Research Professor from the University of Girona. I'm here today in uh, Stockholm and I'm really honored to have with us today Professor Michael Levitt, Nobel Prize winner of 2013 for chemistry. And I'm going to talk to him about his life, his career, his research work and all kinds of different things. So thank you for being here today. It's a great pleasure to be here Marcel. I'm, I'm, I'm a great supporter of young people. And Academy this is young good. people is just where it's at, so I'm yes. really happy. You're welcome. Um, so you were born in, in Pretoria, in South yes, Africa. Yeah. So how, for me, this is quite far away, so quite far away from, from Europe. It is how, definitely far away. How, how was it? How, what is life? What was life, life in... Was, you know, I was, South Africa was a very segregated country then, and I was privileged. I was, I guess... Uh, and uh, it was an easy childhood. School was easy. Uh, Pretoria is pretty close to the equator. I think it's maybe at latitude 26 or 27. So it's quite warm, but it's also quite high. It's uh, 2,000 meters or mm -hmm. 1,800 meters. So the winters are cold. Um, my childhood, I just remember having fun. And I mean, having fun uh, in, in that I was uh, people to play with, uh, having friends. Um, Occasionally some chemistry experiments that my, my mother likes to talk about, about if you take permanganate of potash and glycerine and you just mix them, you get spontaneous combustion. And if you put that inside a, a tin which has been soldered, you, you can get interesting effects. So this is what I was doing when I was maybe 10 or 11, but that's probably as close as to chemistry that I ever got in my life. So this is my, my, my high day of my chemistry. Um, you know, lots of worry about girls and dancing and uh, things like that, playing snooker. Playing golf. Uh, school was, I think, at a very low level, not very challenging. Uh, it was a very happy childhood. You mentioned your, your mother, so your mother gave you this interest in, in chemistry? I don't know, my mother, it's hard to tell. I, I, my mother, she never finished school. She went back to school later. But when she was growing up, she was the third of three children. And basically, they didn't have money to f let her finish school. So I guess she had an ambition for her children. I didn't realize it at the time, but it became more and more obvious. And, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I was curious. I liked to build things, like many kids. Um, and then I think what really changed things, and this is a story which has been told before, but it's a, it's a cool story. When I was, I think, 14, I had, all my friends in school were the the people had most time to have fun, so they were usually like the worst students in the class. I, I did okay, I was never the best, but I was in maybe the top five, but I didn't study very much. And then uh, one night, I went out with my best friend to play snooker, it's kind of billiards, and uh, I came back at 3 a.m. And South Africa was a fairly dangerous country, and you know, there was no taxes or anything, I probably walked home. My mother was furious. So uh, she basically, grounded me, but in a, in a creative way. She basically said, look, school's obviously really boring for you. You have time for all this stuff. Maybe you should actually do something with your life. You know, I probably nodded my head and hoped she would go away. But uh, basically she said that I was, I was at that point, I was, I just finished the uh, third year from the end of high school. Mm -hmm. So she said maybe during the summer vacation, I would take private lessons and skip two years of high school and then go to university at the age of 15. I thought that sounded fun. So, uh, you know, it was actually hard because uh, it wasn't just math and physics, it was English and Afrikaans and history and Latin. So she got private teachers and I, I worked pretty hard. I remember that I divided the week into 21 segments, three a day, and I basically took two of those off a week. So I really worked hard, but after three months, you know, I, got into university. She managed to get me into university. Basically what happened was is that uh, before the summer they, people would set exams for university, but those who failed would be able to have a chance to take them again at the end of the summer. So I just yeah. took them for the first time at the end of the summer. Got into university and then started university in South Africa at the age of probably 15. Um, but it wasn't such a big deal because I remember my, my main pleasure there was instead of playing snooker I played cards. So I, I was always into these kinds of things. Although I, I did physics and then at the end of that year, so now we're talking about like November 1963. Um, I had my mother's brother and sister-in-law were both scientists in London, actually quite well-known scientists. 
and my mother thought it would be good for me to go and spend a summer there. It would actually almost as a treat for having worked so hard, yeah. I would go to London for three months. And I went to London for three months, and basically, uh, when, it's difficult to remember because in South Africa, the winter is the summer, and the summer is the winter. So the South African summer was basically November 1963. I got to London, I remember three days before Kennedy was assassinated. I was on the subway in Piccadilly when I heard the news. Everyone remembers where they were. Um, but after a few weeks, uh, my uncle and aunt, who were scientists, persuaded me that I should probably stay in England. So I decided to stay in England. And it then turned out that the university I lived in South Africa was substantially less than the school leaving level in England. Mm -hmm. So I had to do one year A level, which is sort of the thing, and I was university. And then everything just sort of, I was, I was in that track. Um, so my childhood was, was in some ways, I think, I think because I didn't really have, a, you know, there was the ambition, but I was basically just there for having fun. Uh, and then I suddenly, probably because of an accident, I actually looked at my watch or something, I would have come back on time, none of this would have happened. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it, it's, it's a nice story because it mixes up all these different elements. Yeah. And it's, I think, true as far as I know. And your father, what, what's? My father um, actually studied law. Um, his family had come uh, to South Africa from Lithuania. There were almost all the uh, Jewish population in South Africa were Lithuanians. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother actually came from Southern Europe. Her mother had come from Czechoslovakia. Um, but uh, my father, I, my parents divorced when I was I think, 10 years old. And my father, I don't really feel, had a, a lot of influence on my upbringing. So, um, you know, I. I I'm probably a bit sorry that I didn't. My father also passed away, uh, I think, 14 years ago. My mother is still alive. She's over 100. Oh. And she really had a fun time in Stockholm. I think she was the one who enjoyed it more than anybody. I can't imagine. But, uh, no, I mean, really. I mean, she came here with a dress and a banquet and yeah. interviewed her. So I think that, uh, yeah. So it's a good thing to do for your mother. <laughs> yes. And, and, and do you have any siblings? Any? I have a younger sister and a younger brother. Mm -hmm. Both of whom are sort of academic. My sister is two and a half years younger than me. She just retired quite smartly. I, I, I don't ever see myself retiring. I actually don't think I work. So how can you retire if you don't work? But yeah. she actually was, a, was teaching sociology and economics. My brother is two and a half years younger than my sister, so he's five years younger than me. And he's uh, studied mathematics in Cambridge. And, but eventually he's now doing... Uh, I guess information sciences, and we're actually writing a paper together for the first time huh? on the plight of young grantees in the United States. We've been analyzing statistics, and it's actually a, a very interesting story. Yeah. And uh, I have a very, uh, I have a lot of very outspoken views about the need to support young people a hundred times more than we do. Yes, I think this is a good. Uh, I mean, I feel very strongly because when yes. I was young, I was given the most amazing levels of support. And, and did this, so your brother and sister, they, so your brother went to Cambridge as well? I actually only went to Cambridge for my PhD. So what happened is that I went to, so I decided to stay, that, uh, stay in London. My family mm -hmm. joined me after a few months. And then I got into a London university. Um, I didn't have, I mean, my grades were okay, but for example, I remember sort of formally dropping chemistry during my A-levels. I decided that this wasn't for me. <laughs> and. Uh, I, st I still remember putting sodium into water, and that was fun. Yeah. Um, but everyone remembers that, and I remember the aldehydes, they smelled like fruit. But, you know, I, I was not into experimental work. And uh, then what happened was that there was something else that happened, which I think is also, you know, in life, one's path is very influenced by random phenomena. And in South Africa, there had not been television. And I came to England, and my uncle and aunt, whom I was staying with, had a television. It was probably this big, and it was black and yellow or whatever, yeah. because, but it was a pretty a very expensive television. And I was completely addicted. As soon as I saw this, it was like a real addiction. And fortunately, uh, in January, I arrived in November, end of November, in January, John Kendrew, who had just solved the crystal structure of my drug and gotten a Nobel Prize 15 months before, had a television program called The Thread of Life, which was basically with the first course on modern biology, medical biology. And I was just fascinated. So I sort of, that sort of again pushed me towards doing that kind of science. So quite early, but, but it, you know, I was not looking for these things. And, and that's how I basically went to King's College, finished my uh, 
degree there and then wanted to go to do a PhD in Cambridge. Yeah, in chemistry or, or um, in biology? It was actually it, it was in confirmational analysis. It was actually at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, which is a MRC laboratory, mm -hmm. Medical Research Council laboratory in Cambridge. Yes. Uh, it, there's no formal... It's, it's connected to the university in that they have PhD students who are at the university, but it's not... It's not a, well, it's, I guess it's a formal part of the university, but it's an independently funded medical yes. research council unit. And uh, uh, it was interesting that in order for me to go there, uh, they forced me to go to Israel for a year beforehand. And it took me a long time to realize why they had done that, but I think they realized that uh, calculations on small molecules like cyclohexane that were being done by Lipson and Varshan in Israel could be used on large molecules. Mm -hmm. and I think John Kendrew realized this. I never, I don't think I realized it myself until about three years ago, or two years ago. Um, and uh, this is why he wanted me to do this. So I basically didn't go to Cambridge when I wanted. He made me delay a year, sent me to Israel to work with Ari Varshal and, and uh, Shneer Lipson. And essentially in that year I, you know, did almost everything I was going to do in my life. I basically wrote programs to do calculations on small molecules and large molecules. I got married. Uh, you know, all sorts of things happened. So I then went back to Cambridge you know, in, a, in a very different guise. I was a PhD student, but I already had a couple of papers, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I was very independent as a PhD student. Yes, this is a good thing. And right. you also got the support from... from Amazing support. The, yeah. the, the level of support, I mean, the... the the Cambridge lab that I was at has, has been truly remarkable. Um, I was doing some counting recently, I was giving a talk at a college in Cambridge, and uh, of people who were staff members there, I think 14 got the Nobel Prizes. And this is a lab with probably no more than 80 people. And now this is, so this is yeah. 14 over 60 years, so it's, yeah. it's still, but it's probably 14 out of a thousand or so. I mean, some it's it's a large amount. Yeah. In addition, of the postdocs, probably even 14 out of 200, because the turnover is very small, but they have postdocs, and of the postdocs who have been there, 12 got Nobel Prizes. And it, you know, there's actually one uh, scientist in Cambridge, and he holds the record of having the most uh, Nobel offspring. He had a Nobel Prize himself, and he gave rise to four other Nobel Prize winners. Sydney Brennan. And it's amazing because normally people may have one or two because oftentimes a supervisor gets one with his students. Mm -hmm. This is a person who got one with two of his students and then there were three others who got the prizes separately. So yeah. It was a very stimulating lab and uh, I actually thought quite a lot about what made it so good and I think uh, you were really encouraged to be independent and an example which again, you know, it's very strange in life, certainly as a scientist, you're always thinking about the future. You're as good as your next paper, the yes. past is done, who cares about it? But then you have to give all these lectures and have interviews, and you start to set up to reflect on the past, and you think about it a lot. And uh, so one thing I realized is that you know, Watson and Crick are famous. Crick actually wrote the DNA paper as a PhD student. Mm -hmm. And he was the PhD student of Max Perutz. But the famous paper is not you know, Watson, Crick, and Perutz. It's just Watson and Crick. Yes. And uh, while he was doing this work, he was running, he was doing his PhD for Perutz. And in the Cambridge Library, you can see Crick's PhD thesis. And there's not a mention one word of DNA, but in the back cover, there's a little pocket, and there's the DNA paper. And this was considered completely normal. There was no, you know, it was not like, oh, because I think what people realized is, is that uh, in science, I'm, I'm increasingly uh, aware of this. Yesterday, I was in Jotoburg at a meeting. Nobel dialogue about the future of artificial intelligence, but we also talked about real intelligence and creativity. And it's quite clear that young people, by, by not knowing enough or not knowing too much, you become creative because you don't know what you shouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they were very aware of this and they really encouraged it. Uh, I was a, a PhD student in this lab uh, for four years and getting total independence. I, I never wrote a paper with my PhD supervisor. We, were, we went arguing, we were very friendly. And you know, we did things, and the closest we ever got is we both wrote related papers that were in adjacent articles in JNB, so the page numbers are continuous. But that was it. And you know, this kind of background is really 
you, you really learn from this, and I think that uh, you know, th this needs to be, people need to realize that creativity in science comes from supporting young people. And, and, and you cannot expect you know, that everyone is going to succeed. I mean, no. the probability of doing something which is truly creative, maybe one in a hundred. But if you don't support them, it's zero. And a creative breakthrough, which maybe is monoclonal antibodies or transistors, or they completely change the world. I mean, uh, this is not something which crystallography is a technique. Uh, these things are, you know, complete paradigm shifts and are worth an enormous amount uh, to economy. So the key thing is, is to... To let creativity work. To let create, but but it's, it's also very difficult to explain, I mean, people having to pay for this, how you explain to politicians that you let people do something just quite hard to measure. So you measure it by papers. And I think good papers, and not by where the papers are published, but by their quality, yes. uh, is a, a, an important metric. It's been around for hundreds of years. But if you start to put very careful metrics, like you would like to do on a company, this doesn't work. Yeah. And uh, I think that unfortunately in the world in general, there's been a move away from creative basic science. Um, younger people have become a lot less young. I was again at the same meeting yesterday. I was on four panels, so I ended up having to be funny because it was just so boring. And, and uh, at one point I said, you know, uh, people who used to be independent at 20 are now independent at 40. And, you know, 40 is not the new 20. 20 is the new 20, yeah. which people thought was very funny. But I think the, the point is, is that um, people have, when I was scientists, there weren't very many scientists in their 60s because of the Second World War and the Great Depression. The baby boom is basically expanded into a vacuum. And they just took advantage of that. So I think there really needs to be a conscious effort to support. And I, I, unfortunately, most senior scientists don't think they're prejudicing against young people. They think they've been very supportive. But you know, when they say, uh, oh, well, this person worked with me and I put their name on their paper. That isn't supporting them. No. I would like to say, and how many papers did you encourage them to write themselves? How many international meetings did you send them to? Uh, Etc. And, and that's a much harder thing. And, and uh, again, I've become much, much more aware of my past and the past. And I realized that I've been a pretty good uh, group leader, but I haven't been good enough. I should have been much more proactive about sending people to meetings. So, uh, you know, Max Perutz, uh, John Kendra immediately left Cambridge to form Embo Lab. He was a real major force in, in European science. But Max Perutz stayed there. He just got invi inv invited to all kinds of meetings. And instead of just turning them down, he would just walk around the lab and say, well, would you please go to this meeting for me? And these were often really important meetings. I remember in 1972, I went to a, a CEBA symposium, which were really fancy meetings in, in London at the time. And I was there, you know, I'm basically a 23-year-old graduate, graduate student. And there's Chris Ankinson and Wally Gilbert and Fred saying, I mean, you just anyone you would like to name were all there. And then there's me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but Prout thought that was just a, I mean, on the one hand, he didn't want to go. And therefore, it just seemed like a good thing to do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, that's the kind of thing which. Uh, it's courageous as well. Well, but I think it, it's courageous, but, you know, I know that for him it was a drag. He wanted to do his work, he wasn't looking for the glory. He also felt it was very, very important to educate people. Yes. And, and I think it's something which, you know, somehow, I never understand when a senior scientist is resentful or jealous of, of young scientists, because quite frankly, it's like being jealous of your children. I mean, yes. this is the future. Yeah. So I think but people need to learn. And I'm, I'm getting a lot of data, and, and the data is quite scary. It's mostly data about the USA, because there you have uh, I've got data for 60 years, and I know exactly how many people have been in various positions for the last 60 years, and what ages they were, and when people have gotten grants, and what Congress has done with the money. So in Europe, Europe it's much harder to follow these trails. I, I must say, I've looked at yeah. numbers online, and you can't just get science budgets online. It, no. It's much harder. Whereas every single grant amount in the USA is online. So, so did you already think when you went to Cambridge and did a PhD, what you could obtain, what you would achieve, and, and what, what you're just looking at? No, at, I didn't mm. really care about what I, I, I was achieving and doing things I thought were interesting. I mean, you know, if it, 
a bit I, curious and to see. Curious, but you know, doing science is such an amazing reward for itself because you you're dealing with problem solving, and the problems might be really trivial, like. I have a bug in my program, I can't find it. But it's still, it's a very, it bothers you, you're thinking about it all the time. It keeps you basically, you know, it's fascinating. Yeah. And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, this was sort of an unexpected bonus. I, uh, I'm not even sure I would define it as a bonus, but I think it's, it was a new role that I had to take on. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really did come as a surprise because it was unclear, the particular, you know, as you said, it was a Nobel Prize for chemistry. But I never studied chemistry. I stopped studying chemistry when I was 17 years old. I studied physics. Uh, all the chemistry I learned was, I mean, I, if you said to me, well, you know, is this an aldehyde or an acetone or an ether? I definitely cannot tell you. Uh, and, you know, if I, made, if I said to you draw it, I would probably tell you what the structure looked like. But I, I, you know, it's like being in China, being illiterate or something. Yeah. And, and uh, so it was surprising. And, uh, you know, uh, I think the committee uh, that uh, awarded it to, to uh, Martin Karpus, a reversal myself, it was actually chaired by Sven Lin, mm-hmm. it was very courage- courageous because they did something which, you know, was sort of a, a reward for chemistry, but it was really about biological macromolecules. Yes. They involved computers, but the computers hadn't really solved it. There was much more potential. It would, you know, there's no doubt that it will be valuable at some point in the future, but I mean, it's not like thousands of drugs have been designed using computer simulation. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was for a method. And then they did something that I didn't even appreciate at the time. You know, when, when I got the announcement, I didn't even know what the nomination was for. I didn't even read about it. It, it took like three or four days before I said, well, you know, why did they give this? And it was for multi-scale models. And I, in retrospect, uh, Arya Varsha and myself had, had done models that do have different scales to them. Mm-hmm. It was never our intention to do multi-scale modeling, and I must say, it's a word that I never ever used uh, until now. Now I use it a lot, and I imagine Aria does as well. Um, but basically, they did this because, and I also know that in Swedish, multi-scale is flöskalig, and they, the Nobel Committee, were very happy to tell me about this because they said this was the breakthrough when they realized that by calling it multi-scale modeling, they could isolate Aria Varshall, myself, and Martin Karpus. They wanted to do it because they oftentimes I think they know who they want to give it to, mm-hmm. but they've got to find the right reason. Yes, and uh, you know, and I think, and, and this, it's it's an, it's an amazing. I, I think in some ways, the Nobel Committee rightly see themselves as the custodians of good science, mm-hmm. and they, they set a standard and they do it very very well. And yeah. I, I now again, me saying that is <laughs> very self-serving, and I don't mean it that way. But in no. general, uh, when they have lists of like the favourites. The favorites usually don't get chosen that quickly. And often the favorite lists are based on rate of change of citations and things like that. And I think, you know, they, they think about it very, very carefully. They read the papers unbelievably carefully. Uh, the committees uh, don't use email for security. They use telephone and, and, and postal mail. They meet, I would imagine, 25 times a year. I mean, it's a huge amount of work. Yeah. And they're doing this, and these are people who are you know, and they, I mean, they get some privileges, they get travel and things like that. But I mean, travel, you could argue, is a curse rather than a privilege. And, and uh, you know, and they, so I think it's an amazing thing. I think this is a, I think the world is very, very lucky to have this uh, particular organization. And, uh, you know, it's not easy to copy. Um, and the difficulty well, is that it's also shouldn't be copied. Well, people it's have tried. Well, but people have tried. I mean, uh, you know, yes. there are a lot of other prizes. Yeah. Uh, it's very easy to give away lots more money. So yeah. I think the uh, Californian Breakthrough Prize, I think it's $3 million. Yeah. So it's a lot, lot more. And it's not shared. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot, lot more than a Nobel Prize. But, but it doesn't have the same prestige. It, it has nothing. No. I mean, the, Nobel, you know, the other thing is, uh, the Nobel Foundation puts a huge amount of effort into popularizing science. So yesterday in Nordenburg they had this set of panel discussions on the future of artificial intelligence. They had 30 people that they brought over. Um, you know, these discussions were going all the time. They were on, there were 1,500 people in the audience. It was completely free. They were providing food and drink and lunch to everybody. And, you know, this is exciting. So this is, this is the kind of thing. So in some senses, you know, it, it's almost like uh, the Nobel Foundation, I probably should be very careful in saying this because I'm on, on camera, but it's almost like a group promoting pop stars. They, and and it's, they, they publicity group. And it doesn't really matter who they are. 
Well, you don't have to sing, so you know, yeah. maybe, uh, that would be a disaster for my case. But I, and I think it's great because a lot of young people, I mean, I, I know in my case, if I hadn't seen John Kenner on television, and the only reason I'd be excited by him is he got a Nobel Prize a year and a half before. In Cambridge, I had four Nobel Prizes. It, it completely changed my career. Yeah. And that kind of thing, I think, happens. Now, I, I don't know whether it's, it makes sense. And I, I definitely remember thinking a few days after the award, that this is nonsense, and I haven't changed, I'm the same person. And then I suddenly realized, but just look how you were influenced by these people. I was a PhD student in Cambridge, and I got a stipend, but it was not very much money. Mm -hmm. So my wife uh, went out to work. She had studied biology, and she went and worked in a lab. So I ended up staying at home, and that's probably what made me do theory, because I realized that I could do theory from home, but I couldn't do experimental work from home. Yeah. And we didn't have money for a babysitter, and we didn't want to pay one anyway. So I used to work almost entirely from home. So I was essentially telecommuting without a telephone, without, before anyone knew about the term. And again, the Cambridge lab showed this amazing understanding. I mean, no one ever said to me something like, how come you're not in the lab? I would go to the lab from 9 till 12 in the morning just to punch cards. Mm -hmm. I would do all my working up before, and I'd go there, and the cards would all be set up, and it turns around, and I'm ready to punch very quickly. And I'd go home. And uh, no one ever said anything to me about it. And, and in those days, you know, if I'd walked into the lab like this, they probably would have said, well, where's your shirt and tie? But I just never came in. And um, there was no uh, concern whatsoever. Yeah. So you mentioned the punch cards, so how, because also my supervisor knew, uh, used them a lot and he has some funny stories uh, to tell them about uh, that he, he had to weigh, the way weighing a lot and you had to bring so them from one point to the other. It, yeah, it, so the way things worked, Probably for, I think almost all my creative programs were written with punch cards. I was using punch cards certainly from 1967 to probably 1976, so for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the funny stories are firstly, uh, the punch cards you usually either have boxes in them, or else you try to have a pile which is you can hold in a hand. So maybe this is probably. A box has 2,000 cards, this is probably like 600 cards. And you take the cards, usually have an elastic band around them. So you take the punch cards, you remove the elastic band, put them in the punch card reader, and then you, while they're being read, you shoot your friend with elastic bands. So I became quite good at shooting with elastic bands. I mean, Marshall and I used to have elastic band shooting competitions. Um, punch cards were actually fun. You know, it, it's interesting that uh, the conditions of computing back then were thousands of times worse than now. Yeah. And one way one can see this is, is that uh, when I was in Israel, they were actually quite good because we were very near the computer. Whereas in England, when I went back to my PhD, you had to take the cards, put them in, there wasn't even disk drives on the computer. Uh, you would take the cards, put them into big boxes. The taxi would take them down at one o'clock, bring them back at four with your output and then you might luckily be able to get them again one cell again the next day so you probably had something like seven or eight turnarounds a week and now on a, you know your computer you can have seven or eight turnarounds a minute easily yes. just type something type something but you know it turns out that i think the when i developed probably the hardest problem i've ever developed in my life at that time which i guess you thought and i think in many ways the rate of developing stuff hasn't changed that much and if you look at computer science some of the most amazing algorithms were developed in the 60s and 70s because you had to think, you really have, and, and that, I'm not saying you don't think now, but you know, and now it should be much faster because the tools are much, much better. So punch cards were, were fine, you know, I was, I still have them. I used to use them for lists, they're very strong material. Yeah. They're great for writing lists on. Yeah. And then, uh, and so, electronics. Um, so when you moved from Cambridge, was it difficult to, to leave it? Uh, I think, you know, I never really left. I went, I left, I went as an EMBO postdoc back mm -hmm. to Israel. I, was, yeah. I forgot to answer that. I was an Israeli wife. We went back to Israel. And it was great. I actually went back to work with the same people that I'd worked with before my doctor. So I did a pre-doc and a post-doc. Again with Ariel Varsh and, and with Schneer. And that's when we really did the multi-scale stuff. So it was actually a very creative period. Yeah. Um, probably just a couple of years. And then Ari actually came back to Cambridge and spent a year with me there. Uh, so we had a very good relationship. I think we have seven or eight papers uh, in that 10 years. Um, and then I went back to Cambridge, so you know, I, I, so you, um, yeah, a lot of that, and, yeah. and now I think my wife is not that happy. She said she had to move all the time. <laughs> the kids, we had, it was, it was usually kids and dogs, and, and 
because she wasn't going to give up yeah. having a dog. And uh, you know, and in England at that time, dogs had to go to quarantine. So we actually had a dog that was in quarantine. We actually had several dogs in quarantine. And it's six months. It's like having a, I don't know, I've never had the experience, but it sort of felt like having a, a close relative you love in prison. You have to go and visit them every week, and the dog's happy to see you. And, and, uh, but, uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it's, I think it's important that we didn't want to give up anything. And afterwards, what you then you moved? So I then so then we were in England back again, and I remember in uh, it was 1977 we started to feel really really poor. The, the economic situation in England was was not good. We had three children; uh, they were growing up, you know, and they had to be in good areas, and you, know, you couldn't live when you had a house and things like this. And we just had a, a very hard time mm -hmm. making making ends meet. Uh, well, it's getting interesting because. You know, as a scientist, I would often be invited to go traveling. I mean, we would usually take everybody. So uh, there were an amazing series of meetings that were being held uh, in Europe. Manfred Eigen uh, from Göttingen, who was like, the first German post-war science Nobel laureate, um, had also a very strong desire to educate and spread the word. And when he gave his post-Nobel lectures, he said, look, instead of giving me the honorarium, put twice as much into my fund for these meetings that I organized, and this was called the Winter Seminar in Klosters in, in, in Sweden, in Switzerland. And we were invited to go there in, I think, 1977. And again, I was invited because maybe Max Proust didn't want to go or something like that. I, I mean, we went to the whole family. We actually drove all the way mm -hmm. uh, from England to, to Klosters. Yeah. It was amazing. Um, but we were starting to feel very, very poor. So I actually wanted to do a, a second postdoc in the United States. Although I had a permanent position in Cambridge, so it's like a do go to the States. And actually, I first wanted to go to work with Martin Karpus, but he didn't want me to come. And then I got a position to work at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And I met some people. And they said, you know, do you know what the climate in Purdue is like? I said, no, oh, it's probably fine. You know, in the summer, it's unbearably hot, and in the winter, it's incredibly cold. And then, uh, at about the same time, Francis Crick, who I was quite close to, had moved from uh, England to the Salt Institute in California. Mm -hmm. So I wrote there, and they said they'd be very happy to have me for two years. So we went to California instead of going to Purdue. Or, and that was a great time as well. We were, they managed to get us, a, get us a beautiful house on the beach. And uh, we had our dog and uh, children. Yeah. And uh, what was also interesting then was I didn't really have any computer facilities because the Salk Institute didn't have their own computer. So I started to talk to the digital equipment salesman. And at that time, there'd been a revolutionary new computer called a VAX 780, which was just a, an amazing machine. It came out in 77. So I was talking to the um, salesman. I managed to get an NSF grant. Uh, it was actually a one-year grant, but they gave it to me over two years, so I'd get twice as much money or something like that. And I used this money, I could buy a computer. So I had enough money, it was like $150,000, which was a lot of money back then, yes. to buy a VAC 780. And I was sure the Salt Institute would be very happy for me to put it there. And they said, no, we, our committee didn't approve it. We don't know what this is. So the salesman was very creative. He found a private company that said, yeah, sure, you can, we'll host the computer for you. You could have exclusive use for the first year, and then you've gone, and we'll keep the computer. So I was very happy. So uh, we, we had this, I mean, it was considered a really big computer in those days. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but because it was in a company, the only terminal to the computer was a teletype in our, in our house. And it was very fast. It was uh, 600 characters a second. Uh, and uh, it made a terrible noise. <laughs> Maybe it was 60 characters. I mean, it was actually 60 characters a second. You couldn't type 600 characters a second on a, on a price temper printer. Um, but you know, we had a, it was a good time. Yeah. And, but again, I was mostly working at home. In fact, at the Salk Institute, I was formerly working with Francis Crick. But I'd only go there, I'd, I'd actually work at home, and then at lunchtime, I'd go to work, have lunch with him, and go back there, back home. So, you know, it was, it was a good time. Yeah. And. Uh, after that, I went to Israel in 1979. I actually tried 
to uh, go back to Israel with Arya uh, Marshall to the Weizmann Institute, but mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately it didn't work out. It, it really should have worked out. And, and uh, there are videos that Arya has made that explain why, but I'm not going to go into details. And, and uh, it was lots of ugly sides. Um, but then I went back to the Vice Institute. I was there for I was there for most of the eighties. I got there in seventy nine, and actually to now to the Department of Chemical Physics. And this was the department that I'd actually gone to initially in nineteen sixty seven. So Schneeu Lifson wasn't really a chemist. He wasn't really a physicist, but he called his department chemical physics, mm -hmm. for which the physicists hated him because he dared to use them. Physicists, you know, in 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 primitive societies, I'm being unfair, but uh, you know, mathematicians you know, think they're better than everybody. Physicists think they're better than everybody except mathematicians. You know, chemists think they're better than everybody except physicists. And, you know, and it goes down. By the time you get to biologists, you know, it's awful. And, uh, but I was in that department. And, and uh, again, in, in retrospect, um, I, I think I must have come there very highly recommended because immediately uh, the president of the Vice Minister then was a very famous immunologist called Michael Seller. And by now I'm uh, maybe 31 years old. And uh, he immediately says, you have to become a member of EMBO. So I said, you know, what's EMBO? So he basically gets me into EMBO like the next year. I mean, the people had a lot of power back then. Things mm -hmm. were much less democratic. And then immediately I got put onto uh, the scientific advisory board of EMBO Lab uh, to advise me on computers. So again, that was a, a strange thing. Um, but I was there for eight years, seven years, and then I went to Stanford. Yep. And uh, it's another interesting story. My life is full of, uh, you know, I basically left to myself, I would just sit and work in a corner and never want anything further. But uh, with a family, things happen that make yep. you make decisions and so on. Yep. So now you're probably also in many evaluation committees? Um, uh, not so many. I. I uh, I was earlier on, and uh, I took it quite seriously. I think now I tell people I would love to do it, but I just don't have time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think evaluation, so I, was on, I evaluated the Cambridge lab that I worked in twice. And they, they, they have five-year evaluations. Mm -hmm. I've been on many, many NIH grant evaluation committees. And at one point I had to evaluate all the life science departments in Israel. But in general, I, I, and I've, oh, I've evaluated places in Sweden as well. But usually, usually they get younger people for evaluations because you have the advantage. And, and now I just simply tell them, I, you know, I, I don't want to do it. Um, I think these evaluations are sometimes important, but I think oftentimes that people need, you really need to evaluate the bureaucracy rather than to evaluate the science. And, and they don't, they're not going to bring you into tell us, well, gee, what are we doing wrong in managing science ourselves? Because that is where the problems are. Mm -hmm. um, it's much harder. And, uh, but you know, it has been interesting because I have traveled a lot and I've actually worked, because I worked in Cambridge at the Weizmann Institute at Stanford, I actually worked for more than 10 years in three different institutions as a tenured member. So I kind of got to see the different situations and, yeah. and compare them. And, uh, and did you also see a change in, in the way the, the things are working? So the, the, the proposals from, let's say, 70s, 80s, yeah. from how they are now? And, so and the, the basic science has become much, much so I would say the following, I think in Cambridge things have been pretty much safe. But then if you get 26 Nobel Prizes that you can assign to your lab mm -hmm. in 60 years, you know, you, you can use this. Yes. In Cambridge, the key thing is, is that you have a lot of money for resources, uh, you have zero bureaucracy, at least in those days, you don't have big groups. A group of two or three would be a big group. Um, and you don't have much salary. But this seems to work really, really well. And it's a very peaceful place. Yes. Really, really well for the new science done. Um, I think in the USA, there's no doubt that for young people, it's become much, much harder. I mean, uh, the, the, just the average age of an NIH grant holder has increased enormously. I mean, I take the average age because that's a stable number if I took the age of the youngest person that fluctuates yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah. Um, but the average age of an NIH grant holder uh, since 1980, so in 35 years, has gone up from 40 to 53. This is, so that's a lot. I mean, if your yeah. average age is 53, it's and sadly what's happened is, is it's not, well, there are more old people, 
but there are much fewer young people. And that doesn't make any sense. You can understand why there's more old people, because people have got old and you know you, you don't kill them off, they yeah. have to retire, etc. Um, what is what is much harder to understand is how come there's been a lack of young people. And I think it's, it's hard to say, but I think what's happened is, is that during the same period, um, PhDs have gone from being three or four years to being five or six or seven years. And what maybe was a four-year postdoc has now become a six or seven-year postdoc. And as a result, people are older just because they're be yeah. more busy. Yeah. And I think this is what I object to. I, 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 the reason I object to it is, is it's, it's so clearly a conflict of interest because there's no doubt that as a, as a group leader, it's wonderful to have PhD students stay for whatever. Yeah. I would and love Finishing them. their work. Oh, and whatever and they're finishing, yeah. they do, they, they, yeah. I know them. Yes. They're doing good work. I can talk to them. You know, it's not like having a new person. There's no yeah. training involved. I can send them to meetings yeah. knowing that they're good. Same thing with postdocs. If I yeah. have a postdoc for six or seven years, it's amazing. Yeah. The trouble is it's not right. No. And I, I don't do it. I try really hard not to do it. The trouble is, is that uh, what people have said is, well, science is more complicated today. People have to train for much, much longer. We, they need this explanation. And I don't believe it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I sort of believe that what should happen is that uh, young academics should get their own money. I mean, postdocs. And they should then be able to choose where they want to go to. There should be very little money that I have to pay people that I want. And then the, the postdocs would be able to, and even if these postdocs were not perfectly chosen, even if there was 25% that maybe shouldn't have gotten, it wouldn't make any difference. And then these postdocs yeah. could go around and say, look, I want to work with you. And they would say to her, well, I have my own money, and I expect you to let me write three papers myself. That's fine. I'd like you to help me with this. And can I have my own area? When I leave, do I get to take the work with me? Can we decide? And all this would be decided in the beginning. Yeah. Instead, what happens is it's left in a vague way. And, you know, I, I think in, in talking to some of the more senior people, they, they, they they don't really, it, it's like, oh my god, I didn't even thought about it that way. It isn't like, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing it and I deserve to do it and I can keep on doing it. Um, so I think there needs to be a change. Um, it's too bad. Um, I particularly feel bad because, you know, I, I think, I'm not sure, I think it's just bad because people, when they're young, have crazy ideas. And you want those ideas to have, to go out and, and, and make something of yeah. it. Uh, Use again the creativity. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I think, you know, again in, in the discussion yesterday, I said that uh, I felt that the creativity per unit population in the world is going to increase because of communication. Somebody can, you know, go online in the middle of nowhere and see something and have a good idea. And nowadays, we're seeing more and more that, say, difficult maths albums are being solved by somebody who wasn't really in the area, saw this, saw this, and there's a lot more communication. Mm -hmm. And a lot of creativity involves different people interacting. But I'm worried that in science uh, there, there's going to be much less creative. And also everyone is talking now about applied research, translational research, research metrics. And they don't realize that none of this is really going to measure creativity. Um, too many times the administrators would like to have big, big, name, big name items, you know, the yeah. European Brain Project. That sounds like a really good idea. Except there are problems with it because they give people who are not very good at managing money, lots of money, they rely on them to distribute money fairly. It's not so easy to distribute money fairly. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's interesting in the USA, the situation has become really bad. I mean, it's not just that people are getting older, but the number of grants, the number of people holding grants in the USA has dropped by 2,000 in the last 10 years. So 2,000 people have lost their grants and are not being replaced by young people. Mm -hmm. It's a lot, that's about yeah. 15%. And the reason it happened is, is that, again, very often people don't realize, oftentimes in, in life there are unintended consequences. People do something that looks really good, but actually it's terrible. And what happened was is that uh, at the end of last millennium, in maybe 98 or 99, um, they, uh, the head of the NIH, Harold Ramos, had a Nobel Prize, was very famous, probably thought he was the next best thing to God, uh, decided that they had to increase the NIH budget very quickly. And he persuaded Congress 
to double the budget in six years. What he didn't realize is that when Congress gives you money, you can't say, well, gee, I'm going to keep last year's money. It's got to be spent. Yes. And it's not easy to spend if I give you an extra $3 billion. So what you should have done was go crazy to try to ramp up the number of grants. But it takes time to get new young grant people. You, know, you, can't, you, you don't want to give money to everyone in that age group. And so in the end, what they did is they took the money and they put it into special projects. The Human Genome Project, Protein Sequence Structure Project, various other things. And this way they basically took money and basic science actually gave money to other to existing researchers. They didn't give any new grants, but They're people got, shifting. Shift, got more grants. Yeah. Then what happens is that Congress, after doing this for five or six years, said, okay, we doubled your budget, but now, you know, we got the priorities. So they stopped. stopped completely. But of course, in inflation, so basically the budget shot up and has not been going down. And once the budget starts to go down, you've got to cut people every year. Yeah. And they couldn't, basic science suffered enormously from this because the money went into, and I, by basic science I mean independent individual research grants. Yeah. You can do basic science in all kinds of other ways, but I'm talking about investigator instigated, where you know, you're not working for my team, you're working for yourself, yes. for your ideas. And that I think is what has been the engine that has driven, certainly driven US science. Uh, I did a study on how many Nobel Prizes have come from from medicine, from basic science versus clinical. I think it's 30, you know, 75% of come from basic science. And it's, again, you use Nobel Prizes not because it's just very easy. I don't have yeah. people's names. I cannot look at citations. I yeah. cannot look at impact factors. Uh, it's, 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 it's a criteria. Um, so I, I, I'm very concerned about this, I think. It's, and I'm actually going to do something about that. I'm actually uh, going to be staying in Sweden in hiding for 10 days now to finish writing up the paper. No one knows anything. <laughs> You. We won't tell. You know, won't help. I'm going to stay at home working out. Go to a sauna every two days is my reward. And uh, you know, I want to get this paper written up now. It's, yeah. it's time. And, and people are not going to be happy with the results. But I, this is, these are the numbers. Yeah. And I, I really want people to realize that something has to be done. So my final question: what, Now is your chance to, to give advice to all the young researchers out there. What would you tell them with all the experience you have from, so, uh, from the past, but also the, what would you have been telling now? So I would say, and this I actually have said many, many times, I think do something you really love doing. I think anyone in life, whether it's you know, somebody who works for radio interviewing people or whatever, do something you really love. Because you're gonna have to do it. And I always think it would be, you know, imagine you don't want to go to medical school and your parents convince you to go to medical school, and then you're a really good doctor. So now you've got to do something you don't like doing all your life. Yeah. You know, you didn't fail it. I think be persistent, don't give up. When, 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 you know, I, I think it's probably fair to say that any good idea is going to be rejected. I once made a joke that any paper that was, if a paper was accepted easily, you should withdraw it because it must be trivial. And only if the paper is rejected time and time again is it worth publishing. So really believe in your ideas. And, and you know, the obvious thing here is, is that you have to be the person who believes in your own ideas. Uh, you know, I think beyond that, try to be original. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to uh, go to listen to somebody's talk and say, gee, I can also do that. Unless you can do it in a way that they never thought about and you have connections, it isn't worth doing. And I think finally in life, uh, you know, be nice to people. I, I don't think, and again, if, you know, certain scientists are often have very sharp elbows and they put people down and they think they're getting away with it. And scientists are very quiet and very geeky and, and very not pushy. So often people can push their way through and see, mm -hmm. but in the end they lose. So yeah. I think that, uh, you know, and it's also much more pleasant in life if you yes. are as nice to people as you can be. Yes. So I think those are the kinds of advice. I think it's also particularly important to be nice to people. You know, everyone is nice to the head of the department. You should be nice to the cleaning person. Because one day they're going to really help you. They're going to give you keys and you have to get in. They're going to say, gee, I found this in your trash can. You know, did you want this uh, thing? And stuff like this. So, you know, yeah. and again, I, I, I'm explaining nice as a sort of self-interest, but I think, you know, I think human beings are basically good, and we shouldn't forget that we don't have to be nasty. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we are much better off if we're not nasty. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you for this right. positive note as a final part of this interview, and thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Yeah.